Good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon or evening, uh, wherever you happen to be in the world. Uh, on behalf of the AUA, it's my honor to welcome everyone to this uh, webinar, which has been graciously uh, supported by the uh, Pusen Company. Uh, our topic today is advances in the management and treatment of urolithiasis. And I think we've put together a uh, excellent faculty here uh, for us today to uh, cover this topic and a great program. Uh, just to introduce those faculty, they uh, include Jorge Gutierrez, who's from the Wake Forest uh, School of Medicine uh, in North Carolina, uh, Dr. Tim Average, who's at the University of South Carolina, and then three uh, physician surgeons uh, from China, uh, all of whom are good friends uh, and who I have had the privilege of actually operating with side by side uh, in their respective hospitals uh, in China. And this includes uh, Guo Ho Zhang from the first affiliated hospital of Guangzhou Medical University in Guangzhou, Xiao Feng Gao, who's at the Shanghai Hospital, Second Military Medical University in Shanghai, China, and Kanji Wang, who's from the West China Hospital at Sichuan University in Chengdu, China. And I'm John Denstead from the Schulich School of Medicine uh, here in London, Ontario, Canada. Uh, before we uh, get things kicked off here today, I would just turn first over to Dr. Alan Luan, who's uh, in China, I believe, uh, and from the Pusen Company, uh, just to say a few remarks. Uh, Alan, over to you. Thanks, Dr. Dastit. And uh, uh, it's my great honor here to express my thanks to the American Urology Association and uh, um, to the faculties to supporting this program uh, on behalf of Pusen Medical. Uh, first, I want to thank Dr. Dastit to provide us this uh, a very good opportunity for learning and communication. And uh, since last year, Dr. Dastit to be the secretary of AUIS, feel that the AUA has become more and more collaboration. Uh, in past few years, the China has made great uh, progress. And of course, uh, the Chinese urology has made a, a lot of different uh, achievements, such as Dr. Bo Hua Chen. So Hussein would like to be the bridge between the Chinese physicians and our, uh, with the international platform. Uh, we are also very honored to be one of the strategic partner with AUA. And in this year, we have programs together in Latin America, in the United States, now in China. So uh, we also want these programs can make a lot of success for. Uh, Pusen still uh, provided our best technology and also uh, with our best service with the global uh, urologist. Uh, we wish this uh, event can make successful. Thank you so much. Uh, so to get things uh, started, our first speaker is uh, Guo Ho Xiang from uh, Guangzhou, China. As I mentioned earlier, I've uh, had the privilege of operating with him. He's a true uh, innovator in urologic surgery and has pioneered a technique called super mini PCNL, which of course he'll tell us all about here today. Uh, for treating uh, kidney stones. So Dr. Chang, uh, over to you. Dear friends, dear colleagues, and dear John Professor John Dunst, uh, we're talking about uh, super mini PCN techniques and the indications. As everybody Complications such as too much bleeding, too much infection, even urosepsis. How to decrease bleeding following PCM procedures? I think you always make a puncture from pap follicles, never from infibulant. Because if you indeed do this like this, only 80% vein injury no artery injury, because no artery injury, no embolization. The second day, the second day too many start too many 
different mini PCN techniques was developed, such as microbook, UMP, SMP, and uh, any new problems such as you must use small size axis so you have to you insert They may be cause high pressure. How to decrease, how to deal with all problems caused by the mini pork? Maybe SMP super mini PCN can do it. What is PCN uh, true SMP? Let watch this. Uh, the basic short components video. of the SMP system are an eight French miniaturized nephroscope with a newly designed irrigation suction sheet. The irrigation suction sheet is, is composed of a strip sheet and a handle. The handle consists of, of a irrigation port, a straight tube, and an arboric bifurcated tube at 45 degrees. The suction port located at the end of the arboric tube. The straight sheet is two layered metal structure. The space between two layers of the sheet functions as a channel for the irrigation water, and the central lumen of the sheet works as a conduit for continuous suction. The sheet has side holes at this tape, which allow egress of irrigation through the irrigation channel. The key feature of the irrigation suction sheets is to allow infra and outflow respectively. The irrigation is delivered through the irrigation channel of the sheets. Thus, a one-way flow is created as the infra that comes out of the irrigation channel of the sheets. It's immediately as parity the flow suction conduit of the sheets. The irrigation can create a vertex at this end of the sheets. An active section can help to draw stone back into the suction conduit to remove it. During the suction, the negative pressure can be adjusted by occurring or opening the pressure vent the located in the access and of a body tube. The active section can help to stone back into the suction conduit to remove it. During the suction, the negative pressure can be adjusted by occurring or opening the pressure vent located in the access of a body tube. I think. This irrigation suction sheet system is a real innovation. This system consists of two parts, straight sheets and the hand parts. Sheets consists of two layers of metal sheets, which force tightly gap in between for irrigation. And the six and eight tightly holes are located at the tip of sheets for fluid outflow. There is a window on the hand part, which can the negative pressure by its opening or closing. Sometimes you would like to increase the negative pressure, you only close the window. Sometimes it So, actually, I think irrigation suction sheet system irrigation inflow is from sheets and not from irrigation channel in this endoscope with the suction sheets is separate and because it's a continuous suction and the golden Actually, mostly, you don't need any forceps and the basket to remove stone fragments step by step. You see, this left side is SMPCs. You see, this inflow and outflow is separate. It's a one-way suction, and the stone, stone fragments is suction out step by one by one, very peaceful. And this side 
is a traditional military system. You see, this stone filament always fighting uh, inside sheath. Sometimes parts is out, part of stone filament break down to the cannon. Uh, uh, Actually, our start indicated this new generation SP system can reduce intraleo pressure. You see, average pressure is only 20 millimeter mercury, very low, is less than 30 millimeter HD. I will talk about indication for SMP. I think SMP procedures is limited stone size less than three centimeters and the fair shock away and the flexible uroscope, especially for PDH repression, is resistant to shock away. Let us see this case. This case is younger guys, solitary uh, right kidney with multiple. This low post stone always move to the pelvis upper ureter, cause the ob obstruction, and the patient is low urine. And the 40 days ago, he put a DJ stand and how to manage this case. I first choice is flexible because this is put a DJ stand. Uh, ureter condition is very rare. It's dilated. You can do flexible very, really, very really easily. Actually, you see this AP angle is too small, too acute. Uh, flexi flexible uroscope cannot reach the uh, low, low pole, cannot reach the stone, how to do. And then I turned the patient to the prone position and do make it two punctures in SMP, totally triple ease. The patient stay one night, the next day went to home. Actually, I come, I compared SMP to mini pork for more than two centimeters real stone. This data from five countries, 20 centers. You see, compared to the mini pork for two or three centimeters real stones, SMP is better than mini pork. It's higher stone flow, low complications, and the short hospitalization and the higher tubulis rate. But for two, so for three, so four symptoms, time is a little, little longer. Uh, mini pork is 60 minutes and the SMP is only 56 minutes. But for more than centimeters real stone, mini pork is better than SMP. So I, I recommend SMP indication is only less than two centimeters. Sometimes you can up to four centimeters. Next, I will talk about SMP pediatric little stones. This girls is too young, too young, two years old, right stone, two centimeters, shock with failure. And the stone composition is sister stone for this case. You see, I make a puncture from middle calyx and I use, not to use laser, I use new medical label, uh, new medical research chips to uh, break this stone and the suction out stone. This patient is only Totally tubeless, no tube, no stand. And uh, after operation, one night, stay one night, the next day, went to home. Actually, our, our team uh, have finished 111 pediatric little stone.
three months stone flay up to about 96% is uh, punctured or always upper calyx. You see, this is complication is really low and the low patient need a transfusion. About 86%. So for PDHG little stone, one or two centimeters SNP is a dear choice. And also for some cases, younger guys, simple case, you can do SMP under local anesthesia, and then you can do half day surgery for SMP. For example, this patient is and stay one night at the hospital. Okay, let's see this very interesting video for SMP local anesthesia. Anesthesia. You see this. I make a puncture, be actual from the guiding, combine the X-ray, and then I remove all stone. Stone is off ray. And this is, uh, patient is two punctures. So you see, uh, first I remove this cheese, uh, the first cheese at the sicknesses, I remove the tubules, and the total tubules are uh, low, tubo, low standard. And then the patient is always awakened. I can know everything. I can talk with you, Dr. Zen. Stone is free a lot. And after operation, patient can sit on the operation table. You see? I think this is amazing. You see, I can check a patient is okay a lot. Then it's okay, it's okay. I can get up from this operation table. And the patient is lost pain. He say, okay, then I can ask the patient what from the OT to the wards. And after five hours, patient go home. As chairman of New East, Professor Kemal Sark said, SP, SS, SMP must have a larger definition. S means safe, M means meaningful, and the P means practical. SMP is a safe, meaningful, practical technique. Okay, SMP throw all job backs in mini talk technique achieve excellent clinical outcome, high stone flow, high total tubules, short hospital stair, less complications, low, low blood transfusion. So SNP must the best. Thank you. Your okay. Uh, well, thank you, Prof. Zhang. Uh, that's, uh truly a innovative contribution to endourology. It's a great advance and I congratulate you on uh, pioneering that operation. Uh, so we'll move on now. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Tim Average uh, from South Carolina and he will speak on the topic of urinary tract infection and sepsis in the ureteroscopy patient. Dr. Average. Thank you very much, uh, John, for that introduction. And, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, whatever the case may be. It's really my pleasure to speak with you uh, today regarding kidney stones and infection. So I have no disclosures, except I do take care of kidney stone patients. So over the course of the next few minutes, I'll touch upon some common definitions and fully uh, clarify what we're talking about with each of these conditions with these patients. <clears throat> we'll talk a bit about preoperative evaluation in patients with history of infections. I'll touch on pre and perioperative risk identification for these particular patients. We'll talk a bit about management of infection in patients with kidney stones. 
and then a few special considerations for the times. So definitions. We're all comfortable with the definition of fever, over 101.5 in Fahrenheit or 38.6 in Celsius. Uh, for a UTI, that's going to be a patient with a urine that is positive for bacteria, as well as having symptoms associated with that. Pyelonephritis will have flank pain and fever and a bacteria. And then as we talk about it here today, SIRS or Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, it's going to be a representation of at least two of the following four uh, symptoms. That's tachycardia, tachypnea, fever or hypothermia, that counts as well, leukocytosis, leukopenia, or bandemia. So any two of those criteria meet the definition of SEERS. So another way to look at SEERS is on a continuum along the line of sepsis. So this work uh, published by Chest many years ago, uh, SEERS, as we just talked about, is a clinical response arising from an insult where you see two of those following conditions we just reviewed. It progresses or changes to sepsis if there's a confirmed infectious process related with this, these symptoms. Severe sepsis then is sepsis that has organ failure, and septic shock is the combination of those with refractory hypotension. Here's another way to look at it. The big blue circle is representative of SIRS, but as you can see, other disease processes can lead to these symptoms, pancreatitis, patients with burns, trauma, and others. And then you have infection, and where they intersect is where you get sepsis. And then within sepsis is severe sepsis, again, that's with organ failure. And then septic shock, which again is represented by sepsis with hypotension. So with that in mind, it's much easier to, to think about this whole spectrum of definitions and disease processes. So for ureteroscopy, preoperative workup must obtain a urinalysis prior to any intervention. And if that urinalysis displays signs of infection, a culture should be done as well. If that culture is positive, prescribe appropriate antibiotic therapy based on sensitivity results in an attempt to sterilize urine prior to intervention. Also keep in mind that Patients who do represent with who do present with a positive urine culture or an infection prior to ureteroscopy are at a higher risk of postoperative infection. The AUA guidelines surgical management of stones, uh, which uh, will be touched upon here quite a bit, uh, does have representation for this, as we'll mention here in a second. Antibiotic recommendations. In proceeding with ureteroscopy, the best practice statement on urologic procedures and antimicrobial prophylaxis that was just updated this year in the Journal of Urology talks about for ureteroscopy, for all indications, essentially a clean contaminated case. Typically, the bacteria represented are gram negative rods and occasional enterococci. And really, for antibiotic use, it should be all cases and really of. Uh, benefit for any uncomplicated diagnostic procedures as well, potentially. The first choice of antibiotics would be a trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole or a first or second generation cephalosporin. In patients who have allergies or sensitivities to those drugs, aminoglycoside plus ampicillin can be used, or again, the first and second generation cephalosporin or an amoxicillin clavulinic. I think it's important to point out here that Quinolones, so Cipro, Levaquin, et cetera, are not mentioned as primary antibiotics to be used. And that's due to two reasons, the high resistance rate that exists in the community, upwards to 25% of patients can have a bacteria that's resistant, <coughs> excuse me. And then secondarily, there's been some data that uh, there are rare or severe complications from ciprofloxacin. I think it's important to speak a minute or two about ureteral obstruction and infection, as these are commonly seen uh, and need to be addressed. So ureteral obstruction and UTI, if you have a patient uh, that is presenting in the setting of ureteral obstruction and has fever or tachycardia or hypotension or leukocytosis or pyuria, and those patients with an obstructing stone and suspected infection must be drained ur urgently. 
I think it's very important in wherever you practice at your hospital setting uh, to make sure that your emergency room physicians, your primary care physicians, your hospitalists all are aware of this situation. Because unfortunately, this is something that is uh, missed early in diagnosis and, and can result in harm to patients. So this is a good teaching point uh, to spread to all of your colleagues throughout medicine. But any patient with an obstructing stone infection must be drained urgently. And I think uh, us urologists are very aware of, of this. The guidelines all support that. Uh, Canadian Urologic Guidelines from 2015 for urgent decompression of infected obstructed systems and nephrostomy tube and stent are equivalent. The European uh, Guidelines in 2015 said for sepsis with obstructing stones, the collecting system should be urgently decompressed using percutaneous drainage or ureteral stenting and definitive treatment of stone should be delayed until the sepsis is resolved. And the AUA guidelines, similarly from the surgical management of stones, guideline statements at 20 uh, showed strong a recommendation with a level grade C evidence that in patients with obstructing stones and suspected infection, they should be drained. So the kind line consensus is clear, nephrostomy tube or a stent, and I think that just depends on your situation in your hospital and the illness of the patient. Remember, if it's a larger stone burden, the nephrostomy tube may result in a faster uh, turnaround in, in getting the patients better. Culture-specific antibiotics need to be used, and ureteroscopy should not be performed at the time of infection. Wait until those patients are treated. Um, patients that have SERS or sepsis and ureteral stones, uh, a large series by Borofsky showed that about 10% of those patients uh, uh, died from that, uh, that presentation. And in those that were decompressed, there was a significant difference between those that were not. And mortality was significantly higher in those not treated with decompression. And it comes certainly to no surprise to most of us. So for the actual procedure, and I know many of us now consider not leaving a stent after ureteroscopy, if there's no ureteral injury or stricture, or normal renal function and contralateral kidney, and you're not planning a second procedure, you might not leave a stent. I would certainly make the argument if there has been infection, you may want to consider leaving a stent as another criteria, uh, and that is to prevent any short-term obstruction that may result in illness progression for the patient. Well, how often do infections occur after ureteroscopy? Certainly the largest series to date of ureteroscopy, the Crow study, that's uh, been uh, looked at uh, quite frequently in the large database. Journal of Urology certainly says, uh, certainly published in uh, 2015, almost 12,000 patients. And in those patients, the incidence was 2.2% of patients presenting with a fever or a UTI. In SEERS after ureteroscopy, Dr. Zhang in the Journal of Urology looked at 260 patients. He found an incidence of 8.1% and saw an increased risk in female patients, the stone size, irrigation flow rate, and irrigation volume. I'd certainly might argue the size and volume are markers for time uh, that the procedure took. Uh, other work from a group from, uh, published in the Chinese uh, Journal of Urology showed incidence of 5.9%, and they were looking for a nomogram to predict SEERS after ureteroscopy. Higgins' group showed an incidence of 7.5%, and they saw similar risks as other authors, but they also included uh, elevated BMI, bilateral disease, stone size greater than one centimeter, a high Charlson comorbidity index, and an older age. Again, some of these markers potentially surrogates for time. For sepsis presenting after ureteroscopy, Bloom's group did a univariate analysis and prior, saw that patients with prior endoscopic procedures, recently treated UTIs, multiple comorbidities, and longer OR times could lead to that. So certainly there is a consideration for all ureteroscopy to be much less than three hours, if not even less than two. Another group at Yousef showed that prior sepsis had a threefold higher risk of complications and patients having ureteroscopy. Sepsis after ureteroscopy has also been shown uh, with the risk by having a stent prior. Uh, my former uh, fellow Naveau with a group from Israel 
published in the British Journal, showed a stent dwell time of greater than a month. Female patients again, and if the stent had been initially placed for sepsis, there was an increased risk for sepsis after ureteroscopy. If a patient uh, does end up having infection after surgery, that's essentially to treat it as a pyelonephritis, and that's typically 10 to 14 days of culture-specific antibodies, and certainly a longer duration may be considered if there are positive blood cultures. If you do plan a stage procedure to complete treatment of the stone, ideally you want to repeat the urine culture prior and treat accordingly if there's still residual bacteria. This is a patient I just saw a couple of months ago that had a classic pyelonephritis fever curve and clearly represents a, a spiking temperature that slowly decreased over time. So something that can help with the diagnosis, certainly, if the medical team is considering other sources. So summing up prevention, preoperatively, urine culture should always be performed on these patients and treated accordingly. Perioperatively, you wanna look at culture-specific antibiotics, uh, if necessary, as opposed to just a standard routine. You wanna minimize your OR time. And just a couple points to talk about that we didn't delve into too, too far since the literature is pretty sparse, but your renal access sheath can help reduce the pressure in the renal pelvis and potentially decrease the risk of pylovenous pylophatic backflow and keep that uh, risk of infection down. You might want to send a stone for culture. Uh, certainly the results uh, in PCNL is a bit mixed, but it can help identify a secondary uh, bacterium that may require treatment later on. Postoperatively, you want to monitor those at-risk patients we talked about a little bit more closely, perhaps keeping them around a little bit longer, or certainly having a discussion with them to manage their expectations for any fever. And then uh, there has been some data that shows no benefit to prolong antibiotics at home if the patients do not show sign of infection. So you don't have to send them home on antibiotics that we used to a long time ago. Just another slide on the current considerations in our era of COVID-19, when patients do present with fever, certainly any kind of rapid testing to make sure your fever source is your fever source uh, when it comes to the urine uh, is definitely some of the things we have to think about these days. If one of these patients has to then undergo surgery, you wanna make sure your anesthesia team is well aware of the condition and uh, all precautions are being held. And then I've seen some things in the literature as of late where there's a discussion of placing a nephrostomy tube versus a stent in an obstructed infected patient, whereas nephrostomy tubes may be placed in interventional radiology under sedation and stents are frequently placed in the operating room with some form of intubation. Uh, certainly having discussions with your anesthesia and interventional radiologist prior to patients presenting is best to avoid any potential problems if those needs should arise. So lastly, just a couple take home messages. Realistically, infection after your ureteroscopy is really low risk for most patients, but you can identify some risk factors preoperatively that can help you find these patients and treat them accordingly. If there is infection, treat and obviously clear the infection before proceeding further with further intervention. And lastly, monitor the active patients uh, postoperatively a little bit clearer to make sure there's no sign of infection. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Average, for that great presentation. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Jorge Guterres, who will talk to us about single-use versus reusable ureteroscopes and look at the pros and cons of those different types of instrumentation. Dr. Guterres. How can I do my first slide here? Thank you, John. I want to thank uh, Dr. Danstead and the AUA for inviting me to participate in this uh, wonderful webinar. So um, what I'm going to discuss in the next minutes with you is uh, uh, about flexible and reusable use scopes. Over the last 20 years, we have had a significant improvement in technology for reusable flexible ureteroscopes. We have now an active and passive deflection. We have uh, certainly uh, smaller scopes. We have some uh, models with separate working channels, one for irrigation, one for devices. We have better technology. We have, of course, um, uh, all type of uh, 
VI and SPICE options. In the case of fiber optics, we have uh, some models. We have a number of uh, fibers or increased number of fibers. But over these 20 years, we have had a problem that we have not been able to resolve, which is the fragility of the scope. And the limited reutilization in the best scenario, probably around 20 procedures. Also, we have uh, not been able to resolve the expensive cost of reparation, and of course, the higher cost of digital technology. The disadvantage, uh, just to mention some of the reusable flexible scopes are the reusable fiber optics suffer progressive damage or break of the fibers. Of course, that will decrease the optic quality in, in, the, in the short term and the long term. Uh, all the flexible uh, scopes will uh, have a gradual diminish of or loss of deflection. And again, what I said before, I'm going to show a couple of slides. The number of procedures are limited before you have to send the scope for reparation. The average cost of reparation in U.S. is $7,500. This is in U.S. Of course, it's quite different than different places of the world. And uh, an important thing to consider is once you have sent the scope for reparation, it's going to be a shorted life lifespan between the next time and between the first and the second time that you send a scope for uh, for a new reparation. So this is a, a graphic that uh, Mark Lippitt presented in the last AUA virtual where he compared different uh, scopes and different series. And this is what you get when you use a reusable scope. Best scenario between 10 and 21 cases before you have to send the scope for reparation. Um, also, you need to consider that you need to have a, a, a staff train or specialize in, in, in reprocess the scopes. I've seen some people, some people in South America and other places where it's a single group, it's only two urologists, they have their own instruments, they have their own staff. Yes, they can use the instruments probably 70, 100, I mean 70 times or even 100 times, but this is not happening in bigger institutions with a lot of people working on the instruments. And uh, the mean time that you uh, get in uh, North America to get a scope back from reparation is 11 days, but it can be significantly higher in many other places of the world or in many uh, smaller institutions. So uh, there will be significant delay in replacement of a scope and you need to take this into consideration when you have a, you know, a busy practice. This is a paper coming from Tom Chi in the San Francisco where they uh, did an evaluation of what was the time that they spent in all the complicated sterilization process. From the time uh, up on the left, they, they finished the surgery to the time that the scope went to the, you know, all the process, the, you know, the drying of, uh, and, and then put the, the scope in the sterile uh, machine and get the scope back take in their institution around three hours and 40 minutes. And this is a similar study that was, uh, or a yeah, study that was presented by uh, Don Baldwin in the last AUA virtual. And they, they did the similar thing. They follow what is the time of reprocessing of scope for the time when the scope went to the started machine, it was being one hour and 29 minutes. From the time when the scope is out and is ready to be storage, it is already two hours and 20 minutes. So this is a long process and a lot of people working on this uh, complex sterilization uh, process. This is an interesting study coming from Italy. Uh, what you can see here on the left side, and, and this is a study based on the survey that they did on 20, uh, 90, I mean, 294 sites 156 centers replied the survey. And what you can see on the left side is 17% of the sites, that includes academic sites, small groups, big groups, private groups, 17% of the sites have only one flexible scope. But interestingly, 42% of the sites have only two flexible scopes. On the right side, what you can see is that 42% of the sites had at least one use scope of reparation. So imagine that 42% of the sites have only one scope or two scopes, I'm sorry, and one of the scopes is in reparation. So it's gonna be very difficult that if you have a busy practice, you will accomplish all the flexible uh, urethroscopy uh, cases. 
So um, are the disposable scopes a solution? I will say that the single use ureteroscope is a new scope in every case. The single use ureteroscope are durable. Uh, they are not degradable in a single case. Their uh, performance is very similar to compared to the reusable scopes. And the stone free rate and complication rate, which is the most important thing, are very similar compared to the reusable use scopes. And I'm going to show some uh, evidence on this. This is probably the first study when the um, first reusable scope show up in the market. This is a study coming from Europe. They, they took 40 patients in a different sites. And what they found is, or what they were trying to evaluate what was the quality. And they rated quality very good or good. And the most important thing, there was no difference at the end of the procedure. They evaluated the maneuverability and it was very good or good. And there was no difference at the end of the procedure. So it seems that it's a, a, a technology that can be there. Then came the second um, obligated phase of the evaluation, which was to compare the reusable scopes versus the disposable scope. And this is a study coming from Duke where they compared two reusable scope, one fiber optic, one digital, with the uh, single scope available at that time, reusable scope. And what they found is that the optical capability, the deflection and the flow were very similar between the two options. Many more studies have shown up in the literature, and this is a study where they did an evaluation of 11 studies with 411 patients, comparing now two uh, flexible use scopes, uh, which was lead to view and Pusen, with a reusable scope. And again, the stone free rate was similar, complication rate were similar, and procedure duration were similar. So, uh, the first two available disposable use scopes were lead to view and then Pusen. And this is a graphic that show uh, uh, you what is uh, the resolution, which is very similar compared to a, a fiber optic reusable scope. The field of view is very similar and the deflection without any instrument inside is also very similar. And these are the uh, five use scopes available in the market all over the world. I know that uh, it's not for everywhere. Uh, in North America, we have only available the first two, which is the Pusen scope and the Little View scope. And there are some other places in the world who, which uh, are available one or two or three of the other five options that uh, are currently uh, worldwide uh, uh, available. This is uh, a graphic that compares what is uh, the difference in the characteristics. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's very similar. I'm gonna focus only on the two scopes that are available in North America, which is the Pusen scope and the Boston um, uh, little view scope. And as you can see, the external and diameter is very similar, 9.5 French. I know that Pusen is launching soon a scope that is gonna be 7.5 French. The diameter in the tip is a little bit smaller for the uh, little view. The time of use is similar for hours. Working channel is the same, and the depth of field is basically the same for both uh, uh, options. So uh, this is a graphic that I thank Dr. Dominic from Chile, who allowed me to use this. And what I'm going to show you here is a quick uh, videos of uh, what is the difference. This Next one is going to be penetration, and the third one is going to be uh, the different scopes, usable scope uh, with three different models of, uh, um, I mean, a one disposable scope with three different models of reusable scopes. And this is a study where they did an evaluation of successful visualization, stone extraction, and time to complete the stone extraction in kidney models. What they found is that visualization and Kalis's identification were similar, huh? were similar for, um, Little view, the two models of view scope and the Boabishan, 
which was a, a reusable scope. The time of completion was better for Boa Vision. Stone extraction were similar for Little View and the second generation model of Pusen. And uh, the best image quality was uh, rated for the second generation of uh, Pusen, although there was not a significant difference. So you can see here that the quality of all the reusable scope available are very similar. And I think it's very, very comparable with the re reusable scope. I mean, disposable with reusable scopes. This is an interesting study uh, where they take 10 liter view scopes and 10 Pusen scopes and they evaluate what was the durability of the scope. So at the beginning, the deflection was 280 to 190 degrees, a little bit more for Pusen in this study. But the interesting thing is after 200 deflection, the deflection still was above 250 degrees and that was similar for the two U scopes. Again, durability is being tested in these reusable scopes. Now, I think the important thing is the cost implications. And this is something that every single institution and every single country has to evaluate in their own places. This is a study coming from Mayo Clinic in Scoitel, Arizona. They took uh, 348 patients that they did in a year of flexible ureteroscopy. 160 of these cases uh, were treated with reusable scopes. You can see here that the number of uses for the reusables, the mean number were 2.5 cases per scope. And when they uh, evaluate the cost of reparation and the reprocess was 848 in their institution. They conclude in their institution, if they have more than 99 cases, probably the cost benefit is in favor of reusable. Again, this is a single institution and you need to be sure what is the cost in your own institution. This is again the study from Tonchi in San Francisco. And what he, they did is they add to the cost of the scope, the operating room usage cost, the scope preparation cost and all the uh, cost involved in the <coughs> reprocessing of the scope. And at the end, they found very similar prices. The total cost per case were very comparable if they use a reusable scope or a disposable scope. And this is an interesting study uh, coming from Chile, again from uh, Alfredo Domenech. And this was presented at the uh, World Congress of Endo-Urology in Dubai last year. So uh, what they did is, it's a small country, only 17 million people, but they, 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 they had an evaluation of uh, how many scopes, disposable scopes uh, people are buying now. In 2015, uh, they, all the sites that did a, they, they evaluated bought or purchased about 15 reusable scopes from a single company. In 2016, they start using the reusable scopes and at the end of 2019, you can see the purchase of reusable scope have dropped by half and the number of disposable scopes have increased significantly for 15 use scopes in 2016 to 1,650 use scopes three years later. So that means that I think this is going to be the trend all over the world in different countries. When to use a reusable uh, our, our disposable scope. In our institution, we use the disposable scope in complex cases. What means complex? Stone in the lower pole, more than one centimeter, large renal stone where we cannot do pergidinous surgery for any reason, complex intrarenal anatomy. Um, we avoid to use uh, disposable scopes in short cases and simple cases. We suggest uh, to use disposable scopes when a resident is in training or when uh, limited reusable use scopes uh, is, 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 is an issue in your institution and when limited reparation or replacement is uh, also an issue or take a lot of time or when cost and reimbursement justifies. So in summary, disposable use scope, it's a new scope in every case. There are no cost of reparation involved using disposable use scope. There is no um, a complex or uh, yeah, complicated sterilization process involved using disposable scopes. And uh, our suggestion, uh, I mean, the most important thing is that the, it's a comparable optic, comparable quality of imaging, comparable functionality between disposables and current reusable scopes.
Our suggestion is use disposable scopes in complex and difficult cases and avoid the use of disposable and simple cases. And work on cost analysis for flexible ureteroscopy with your institution. See what is the real price per case in your place. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Guterres, for that very interesting lecture, uh, very comprehensive. Uh, our next speaker will be Dr. Zhao Feng Gao from uh, Shanghai, China, who will talk about prevention and treatment of renal vein and inferior vena cable injury during uh, PCNL. Dr. Gao. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, Dr. Gao from uh, Shanghai Hospital, Shanghai, China. And the uh, renal vein injury and the misplacement uh, placement of nephrostomy tube during PCNL is a rare but severe complication. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, how to prevent and uh, manage this complication. And uh, PCNL is the first line treatment for large renal stones. And uh, according to the EAU guidelines, there are many complications following PCNL, such as transfusion, fever, and uh, sepsis, and organ injury, and, and so on. Injuries to main renal vessels are uncommon, less than 0.5%. And the reported incidence of misplacement of uh, nephrostomy tube is 0.2% to 0.5%. Even though venous injury is rare, improper treatment of this complication could lead to serious consequences, such as hemorrhage, embolization, perforation and infection. And the possible mechanisms of venous injury include renal vein is proximal to renal pelvis and the major posterior calicus, punctured to medial, uh, excessive checked dilation, injury to the low calicus wall, and uh, pushing too hard on renal pelvic stone with the ultrasound lysotripate probe. And the literature revealed 10 cases of renal vein injury and intravenous misplacement of nephrostomy tube following PCNL. And the most patients with venous injury can be managed conservatively with a nephrostomy tube. And the nephrostomy tube was usually withdrawn by stages, seven to 14 days on the CT, ultrasound, and the fluoroscopy. Stones could be removed by simultaneously PCNL or second PCNL. And some operators select open surgery on the side of caution. All reported cases were discharged eventfully. And next, I will present two cases of venous injury during PCNL. And the first case is renal vein injury during PCNL. And uh, this surgery was performed in a conference. So we saved the complete data, including the operation video. And uh, the patient was a 67 years old man with left renal colic for half a year. There was a history of open nephrolysotomy for the left kidney. And the KUB and the CT revealed multiple left kidney stones. And this patient was prepared for PCNL. On the ultrasound guidance, the percutaneous puncture was performed to the middle calyx. After removing the 
Still, no urine was noted. However, the surgeon still inserted the guide wire and performed balloon dilation. After inserting the scope, After inserting the scope, severe bleeding was observed, and at the end of the sheath, fatty tissue and a fissure was observed. The guide wire went through the fissure. And the surgeon believed that the depth of the sheath insertion was not enough. So she pushed the sheath forward and squeezed the sheath into the fissure. However, no stone was found and the vision was blurred. And a continuous warm blood was outflowing from the chest, and a massive bleeding led to blood vision. And suddenly, a branching opening was observed, and the surgeon realized that he had put the sheath into the renal vein. The branch opening of the vascular trunk was unique, different from the renal collecting system. And then he removed the sheath immediately and uh, compressed the tract for 15 minutes until the bleeding stopped. Fortunately, no perineal Hematoma was found by the ultrasound. <sighs> so he punctured again and built another axis, axis for PCNL. And compared with the operation CT image, the post-operation CT showed there was no obvious abnormality around the kidney. And under close monitoring for one week, the patient discharged eventfully. And the second case is a misplacement of a nephrostomy tube into inferior vena cava during PCNL. And uh, this patient was a 62 years old man with Stankhorst stone in right kidney. The operator built a 22 flange axis and uh, it accompanied with active bleeding and the unclear vision caused unsatisfied research history. Then he put a 14 flange nephrostomy tube along the guide wire, and there was no improvement after clamp the tube for five minutes. Therefore, he ended up the operation. And the post-operative immediate KOB showed the tip of the tube was looked near the spine, and the CT showed the tube was in the IVC. And uh, the DSA was performed immediately and no arterial injury was found. 
the contrast material was injected into the tube, and the image showed the tip of the tube was in IVC. <laughs> Then he withdraw the tube from IVC to the window van on the DSA. And then pulled the tube to the collecting system slowly. The venous system was slightly enhanced, and the collecting system was obvious enhanced. And the immediate CT proved the tip of the tube was in the collecting system. And the patient discharged 10 days later without obvious complications and waited for second PCNL. Uh, the in endoscopic characteristics of venous injury during PCNL showed in the below pictures. First, massive bleeding usually caused unclear vision and it's hard to find the stone. Second, we could see the cavity structure and the branch opening of renal vein with irrigation, and the CVP might increase. Third, the wall was pale without a texture which was different from the mucosa. Besides, the imaging features of venous injury are also important. CT and DSA can locate the tip of the tube in the venous system. Management. Previous study usually suggest, suggested using a nephrostomy tube for completion. Then withdraw the tube in stages. And the stones can be removed by simultaneous PCNL or laparotomy or second PCNL. And we suggest that for window vein injury during PCNL, withdraw the sheaths immediately and stop bleeding by compression. Then build another case access axis for operation. And for the tube was misplaced in IVC, withdraw the tube to the collecting system on the DSA immediately was feasible. And all patients discharged on eventfully. And the preventions. Uh, the prevention strategies include first, clear or reddish urine must be noticed out flowing from the needle tract if on the ultrasound guide puncture. And the second, if under the fluoroscopy guidance, the guide wire and the dilation process must be monitored. And the third, Anticoagulated pyrography is recommended to check the exact positions of the tube when necessary. And thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Gao. Uh, I'm sure we all feel the same that we hope we never see a case uh, like that. But uh, it's good to, to hear about your experience and how you managed it uh, in case we do happen to see a case like that. So thank you for giving us that uh, demonstration. Uh, we'll move over to the next speaker, who is Dr. Kanji Wang at West China Hospital in Chengdu, China, who will give us a very interesting presentation entitled, The Crosstalk of Gut Microbiota and Kidney Stone Disease, Role of Microbiota Metabolites and Local Inflammation. Dr. Wang. Uh, thank you, dear prof Professor Denster. Uh, it's my great honor to join this session. Uh, I want to express my uh, thankful for 
uh, American Neurological Association's environment let us can uh, meet so many worldwide famous professors online, especially uh, I can meet uh, my dear friend and my dear uh, teacher, Professor Denster, again, uh, use this special way. And I also want to thank Lori, so, so many helps. Without her helps, Um, as we all know, the causing of Sydney storm is the most uh, main part of the kidney storm, which we meet every day. Uh, and uh, as we know, if we cannot figure out how to prevent this disease, the recurrence rate is, is very high. Uh, almost 20 to 50% within five years. For this most common com com component of the red storm, uh, they were cost almost uh, 4 billion uh, in 2030 in United States. So we just want to figure out more consultation of food rich of oxalate may be cause the renal calcium oxalate stone. But when we drink more water and reduce the intake of food rich of oxalate, the result doesn't look so good. So this makes us rethink about what's the key effector uh, make the happens of casting oxalate stone. As we all know, the gut microbiota is a very interesting thing because they have so many huge bacteria in the human gut, which is, as we know, they have many evidence told us the gut microbiota is associated with many diseases like uh, uh, diabetes, hypertension, this disease more all have some connection with the gut microbiota. So in our research is be, is based on the previous some uh, ex, uh, experiment of other doctors. They found if in the renal stone patients the gut microbiota diversity is decreased and the amount of oxalate degradation bacteria and the gene which is correlated cur cur with the urinary oxalate excretion also is dropped. So this uh, result makes us think they maybe have some mechanism connect the microbiota in the gut and the causing oxidate storm. But uh, what's the mechanism underlying this? We need to figure out. Our hypothesis is the oxalate in the gut maybe can influence by something and uh, this influences the transport of oxalate between the gut and the bladder. And uh, they, there are some, uh, uh, some other things, maybe they can secrete from the uh, microbiota into the blood and then influence the local inflammation of kidney, which at the end influence the the happening of renal calcium oxygenate stone. So the first step, we just want to use some experiment to testify the microbiota's metabolites can influence 
the oxalate transportation. This is our um, uh, experiment set up. We collect uh, 153 Chinese, uh, Chinese uh, people. They, some of them is a real, real stone patient, some is just a health people. And we use the 16-SRNA gene sequence to find out what's the difference of the microbiota between the two groups. And uh, we found that the result is uh, uh, short chain fighting aside uh, producing bacteria was lower in the uh, stone disease patients got microbiota and the genes uh, and which can uh, producing the short chain fat aside also was lower in stone patients. As we know, the oxygenate can go from the gut to the bladder and they also can go from the bladder, bladder into the gut. They have two kinds of transporters. They, they, they just do this job in two directions. Okay, so we just wanted to find out does the assumption can influence this very important transport of the oxalate. So we set up our uh, experiment to use some rat and uh, also we supply the three kind of short chain fatty acid to see what's going on. And uh, the very interesting findings we found the three kind of short chain fatty acid can significantly reduce the formation of calcium oxalate and uh, can reduce the concentration of urinary oxygenate. And uh, the acti and the propylate can increase the expression of A6 transporter and the propylate and the butyrate can decrease the A3 uh, transporter's expression. And uh, so based this part of the experiment, we found a very interesting uh, result is the, the metabiotic uh, product of microbiota, uh, which short chain uh, fight aside can regulate the expression of intestinal slate transporters, which may be leading to lower the urinary oxalate concentration. And um, this makes the least renal calcium oxalate crystal formation. And uh, the next part of our experiment, we just want to figure out, does this kind of short chain fatty acid can have some regulation effect on the kidney inflammation? which may cause to the formation of calcium oxalate stone. So in this part of our investment, we, why we think the inflammation with the uh, renal calcium oxalate is based on some uh, other doctors' workers and, and some of our previous uh, investment. We use, we set up some, another kind of animal model, which can induce the calcium oxalate stone in the mice. Then we test the stone mice and the normal mice, the uh, gut microbiota. Then, and also we test the uh, mice immunity cell to see is there any difference. And the very interesting findings, we found the very significant difference of the immunity cell sub type difference between the stone group and the blank control group. And uh, we use the high-suit immunocytogenic 
genetic analysis, and uh, we also found the uh, cluster 12 and 15 CD45 uh, positive cell and the dendritic cell subside, subside cluster and the macrophage subside was more in blank control group. That means this kind of uh, immunity cell was uh, reduced in stone disease group. And uh, we also use some the cytometry to separate this uh, CT45 positive cell from the uh, stone disease group and the uh, blank control group. We then for 824 differential gene was screened out. And uh, this differentiated gene are uh, mainly related to the bio clock and the inflammation, which testifies the inflammation may be the key effect between the microbiota and the oxidated, calcium oxidated stone formation. And uh, the differentiation genes are also related to the vitamin metabolism and the sh short chain fight aside metabolism. And uh, based on this result, maybe the calcium oxalate stone formation is associated with the inflammation. So we want just to see which kind of effect can regulate the inflammation to reduce the chance of the stone formation. Then we reduce the three kind of short chain fight has said to say what's happening. So we add this three kind of short chain fight has said to the drink order of the mice to see what's happening. And very interesting we found uh, at first is this three type of short chain fight has said can regulate the immunity cell of the mice. The acti can effectively increase the proliferation of regulated macrophage, and the butyrate can significantly reduce the production of interferon six. Okay, and uh, then we try to figure out the immune cell and this short chain fight has set and the uh, tuple epicenial cell and the casein oscillate formation together, put them together just in some experiment environment. When we put them together, we found a very interesting thing is the short chain fight has side can reduce the calcium oxalate crystal adhering. And uh, some immunity cell also can do this job. Especially if we use the 663CR1 positive macrophage co culture with the tubal epithelial cell, we also can find that this immunity cell can reduce the calcium oxalate crystal adhering with the epithelial cell. And uh, the three kind of short chain fatty acid can increase the macrophages effect of reduce the uh, adhering of the uh, epithelial cell with the calcium oxygenated crystal. So it looks like the short chain fatty acid can do this job. And also the macrophage and some immunity cell all can do this. So this 
testify just some uh, in vitro experiment also show us very interesting effect um, is maybe we can use the short chain fighting aside as some uh, medicine to regulate the formation of the uh, stone disease through the regulate of the immunity and the inflammation. So what's the next? I think uh, they just some very primary data about the um, gut microbiota and the inflammation. And we found the short chain fight has said is a very good candidate of the bridge between the microbiota and the uh, oxy calcium oxygenate stone formation. But they must have lots of hundreds of mechanisms we need to figure it out and uh, to help us to understand thing of the calcium oxalate formation. When we figure out what's the true reason of calcium oxalate formation, maybe we can think up, figure it out what's the best way to prevent the recurrence of calcium oxalate renal stone. Uh, this is our uh, team group. Uh, um, Professor Li Hong is our um, previous uh, president of our university. With the help of Professor Jin, Professor Xuan, uh, is very helpful to help us with some basic uh, investigation of immunity investi investigation and uh, with the help of our postdoctor and the graduate student, they do huge of uh, excellent uh, basic research work. Uh, so we can get this very primary data to show <coughs> our um, doctor and uh, uh, colleagues. Thanks. Thanks again for the invitation of American Urological Association. Thank you very much, Dr. Danster. It's uh, that's my presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Wang, for that uh, very interesting talk. Uh, great research work, and we look forward to hearing more about it uh, in the future. So uh, I'll finish off here. The last lecture will be on uh, complications. And Maddie, if you could bring up my slides. Uh, you know, even in the best of hands, things can go wrong. So it's important to know about prevention uh, and management of complications, which is what I'll discuss here in the next 15 minutes. And it's an, a very important topic uh, because of the vast increase that we've seen in ureteroscopy really around the world. Uh, this is uh, from here in Ontario, where I am, which shows trends over the last 20 years in stone management. And the red line that you see in this graph is ureteroscopy. The blue line is shockwave lithotripsy. So there's been a very uh, significant decrease in the number of shockwave cases and a vast increase in ureteroscopy. And you can look almost anywhere in the world to similar publications from Germany, Denmark, Australia, all showing the same trend. Uh, so given this vast increase, it's now one of the most common procedures in urology it's important to know about the complications. And of course, it's uh, information like we see here that has uh, led to that profound change in stone management around the world. So this is a series of cases from very prominent uh, endourologists here in North America that show results in managing proximal ureteral stones with the flexible ureteroscope with excellent stone-free rates, uh, very low rates of complications, uh, and so forth. So it's information like this that is uh, really propelling this treatment uh, forward. If we look at the uh, uh, incidence of complications with ureteroscopy, uh, we heard about the Crohn's database earlier. This is from that same series, uh, close to 12,000 patients and an overall rate of complications of 7.4%. Uh, it seems a little high, but most of these are rather minor things, clavian one and two complications. 
Uh, I would just highlight one bullet point there, five deaths uh, in the Crow series. So, you know, it seems like a minor operation, but the worst can happen uh, even in the best of hands and there were five mortalities. Uh, <clears throat> when you're looking at uh, papers and so forth and you know, presentations about complications, uh, Quite often we'll hear about the Clavian system. I'm sure most people are very familiar with this. Uh, Clavian 1 is very minor. Clavian 5 is death. And you know 2, 3, and 4 is uh, everything in between there in terms of the severity of complications. Uh, the other way to look at it uh, for your ureteroscopy, the complications can be uh, early or late, which is how I'll classify them in this talk, uh, or major and minor with the Minor things being very small perforations that typically will heal up uh, quite easily. Uh, major complications would include avulsions, ureteral endosusception, uh, and so forth. And we'll look at some cases that reflect uh, each of those. Uh, I do give credit to Olivier Traxer. I think uh, Olivier has uh, propelled uh, forward retrograde interrenal surgery as much as anybody over the last 10 years. So this is his fairly recent uh, uh, publication that looks at complications and is somewhat similar to the Crow study. Uh, overall complication rate of uh, 15%, which uh, again seems uh, a little bit high, but uh, most of the uh, complications are very minor, things like stent symptoms and so forth. And I know a lot of us wouldn't even uh, uh, refer to these as complications. It's kind of just part of the procedure. There has been a decrease uh, in the complication rate over time. If we look back years ago, some of the early publications by the pioneers of ureteroscopy and the uh, very high rates, uh, I think we would say, of strictures and perforations and even avulsions. And uh, really uh, part of the reason for this was the uh, instrumentation that we were using at that time. But just to emphasize again that uh, although we look at ureteroscopy as uh, kind of a very minor procedure in urology, the worst uh, can happen. And these were uh, interesting series of life-threatening complications after ureteroscopy. So we're talking about perinephric hematomas, uh, uh, sepsis, and so forth. And some of these cases actually ended up uh, having nephrectomies done as a life-saving uh, surgery for bleeding and so forth after ureteroscopy. So what do we mean, uh, and Ben Franklin here, by this statement, ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So uh, what we're referring to here is it's always best to try and prevent complications uh, if you can uh, before you get into them. Some of the key things to safe ureteroscopy are listed here. So uh, like any operation, good uh, pre-op planning, uh, methodical approach to the procedure, knowing when to bail out. So that would be uh, seeing pus uh, in the urine if you've got bleeding, poor visibility. It may often be best to put in a stent and come back uh, another day. And of course, having the right instrumentation. So it depends on your circumstances, of course, and your resources, but we would regard these things as uh, essential. So we would always have fluoroscopy available. Uh, typically use the C-arm. We're now hearing more about uh, fluoroless ureteroscopy, but we think it's still very important to have uh, fluoro available to help guide us during the operation. Uh, an array of guide wires, you want to have a variety of scopes, uh, catheters and so forth. Uh, still a homium laser would be the standard uh, lithotriptor and also nitinol baskets which have been a very great invention for ureteroscopy. As mentioned earlier in the past, the instruments were very large in size. This is from uh, a past era. Uh, rigid scopes could be 11 or 13 French in size. And it's probably not too surprising that complication rates were greater when you were working with such uh, large instruments. Now, the standard uh, rigid scope in our practice is rigid ureteroscopy in the distal ureter and flexible up above the iliac and up in the kidney. So when we are working with a semi-rigid scope, it would be a six to seven French instrument. Uh, uh, and these are very atraumatic. They usually don't require dilation of the ureter and also give us the opportunity to use uh, fewer stents. Uh, as mentioned earlier, the other critical piece of equipment is the holmium laser. So uh, we participated uh, in the very uh, early series of these, and this is one of the first publications here. 
our first 23 cases. And, you know, I think it became very obvious to people early on that this was a excellent instrument for breaking up uh, kidney stones. And we're hearing about other newer lasers these days, such as the thulium, but still worldwide, the holmium would still, I think, be regarded as the standard of care. Uh, the other big advance for us has been in the ureteroscopes, so whether they're reusable instruments. Uh, you know, I think Jorge did a great job comparing uh, reusable versus uh, disposable ureteroscopes. Uh, and you know, it depends on your environment and your resources and so forth, but really these instruments overall have improved uh, dramatically uh, over the years. And again, Jorge, I, I think, uh, has covered off the pros and cons here very well uh, with the disposable instruments. Uh, the one thing I would say it really is, has been amazing to me to see how a piece of plastic could be turned uh, into a ureteroscope, basically. And it's a great tribute to the engineers who have developed these instruments that will produce very high quality uh, imaging uh, into a disposable piece of equipment. Uh, I worked uh, years ago to some of the very early prototypes, and I was actually very skeptical that it was actually going to work. But, you know, others have now propelled that forward, and it's uh, tremendous to see these uh, newer uh, instruments. I think Tim Everich has covered the antibiotic question very well. And this, of course, is in our guidelines from AUA. Uh, our practice generally is just perioperative antibiotics at the time of the procedure. And then we also would give antibiotics at the time of uh, stent removal, which is typically one week uh, after the operation. You know, a question comes up about pre-stenting uh, before flexible ureteroscopy, which makes it frankly, an easier operation. Uh, the ureters dilated, you've got more room to work. Uh, and I do know this is fairly common in uh, Asia, particularly in China, to pre-stent patients. But uh, at least here in North America, it's, it's not been recommended. That commits the patient to two procedures, essentially, and a week or two of stent discomfort prior to the ureteroscopy. So this from our guidelines that pre-stenting unless it's a kind of exceptional case, is generally not recommended. Uh, another question is about the use of safety wires. This was uh, dogma in urology for years that you always must work with a safety wire. Uh, my own practice now, if the stone is in the ureter, I would work with the safety wire in place. If the stone is up in the kidney, uh, interrenal location, I would not uh, use the safety wire in that case. So we'll get the scope up in the kidney, remove the wire, and work uh, without the wire uh, in place. And not to get into a lot of technical detail here, I'm sure most, if not all, people on this webinar are doing a lot of ureteroscopy, but the basic principles here with rigid is uh, having a clear field of view at uh, all times making sure the scope is sliding uh, smoothly and easily within the ureter. Those are the key things to avoiding uh, complications uh, in ureteroscopy. And sort of same principles with the flexible scope. Uh, of course, there are very small channels in these. Uh, pressurized irrigation be, can be useful to clear the field of view. Uh, we always put the scope up uh, over a guide wire, railroaded up over the wire, that's the easiest and best way to get around the ureteral orifice to successfully place the flexible ureteroscope. Uh, if we transition then and look at the complications and just general management of these, uh, perforation would be amongst the most uh, common things that you might see. This can be from the laser or from the guide wire. And generally, very small perforations, such as I've just described, those will heal up uh, quite readily with uh, a very low chance of getting a ureteral stricture. Uh, and uh, typically, I perhaps would leave the stent a little bit longer uh, in those cases. But most perforations that are small will heal up without uh, long-term complications. Uh, similarly, uh, submucosal tunneling, this is you know, more severe than uh, just a simple perforation. Uh, the main point here is make sure you do find the true lumen, ultimately get a guide wire up and leave a stent. And in a case like this, uh, I'd probably leave the stent uh, a little bit longer afterwards to facilitate the uh, healing of the ureter. 
Uh, we'll talk a bit here about the use of uh, access sheets, and you can read this statement on the slide here yourself from uh, Alberto Breda and his colleagues uh, in Europe uh, who are uh, advocating for the use of your reader access sheets. In my own practice, uh, I really would not use an access sheet when I'm working on a ureteral stone. Uh, at least for me, the place for an access sheet is for, say, a larger stone that's up inside the kidney uh, so that I can uh, have a clear field of view, decrease the pressure in the kidney. Uh, but overall in my practice, I'm only using an access sheet about 10 to 20 percent of the time which is probably a bit less actually than uh, I think in a lot of uh, contemporary practices today. If you are using an access sheet, you have to make sure that it's going up uh, easily. I think many or most of us have seen these famous pictures now from Olivia Traxer with uh, access sheets uh, injuries to the ureter. Uh, if somebody's had a stent in already, the access sheet will go up easier, but uh, you do have to be very careful about uh, advancing this, that is sliding easily uh, up into the ureter to avoid uh, pictures and complications such as we're seeing here. Uh, there is some debate uh, about whether access sheets improve stone free rates or not. Uh, this particular study uh, actually showed with or without an access sheet that the stone free rates uh, actually were the same. Uh, so, debate about whether they help to improve stone free rates. You know, I think a lot of us think, though, that particularly in prolonged ureteroscopies, that uh, there may be less chance of sepsis and probably a better field of view. So, it's those types of cases where uh, we would use uh, uh, an access sheet. You know, I think there's more attention now being paid to the pressure uh, inside the kidney. And it is likely, actually, that we're going to start seeing both scopes and access sheets in the future that will have pressure sensors that will give us a warning about uh, when the pressure is getting up higher inside the kidney to avoid uh, extravasation, sepsis, and perhaps even perinephrochematoma. So we'll be seeing uh, further advances in the uh, engineering of this uh, in the near future. Uh, Perinephrochematoma, I think those do occur when you've got very high pressure. Uh, some risk factors for that are listed here of a thinned out hydronephrotic kidney. Long OR time are the types of scenarios that can lead to uh, the setup for perinephrochematoma. Uh, the other thing to mention here is uh, if we're doing bigger stones inside the kidney, and let me say I typically would only work for about 90 minutes on any ureteroscopic case, and if it's going to be longer than that, I would stage the operation. But there is a bit of concern when you have an access sheath up that uh, if you're in a very prolonged case that there can be ischemia of the ureteral wall and the possibility of uh, stricture afterwards uh, on the basis of the access sheet. Uh, submucosal stone, uh, to emphasize the point here, if uh, you have a perforation uh, and the stone goes way outside the ureter, will probably be fine to leave it. Uh, I think you do have to tell the patient, but it shows up on x-rays afterwards just so there's no confusion. Uh, the important point, though, is uh, to get the stone fragments out of the wall of the ureter, uh, don't leave them uh, in the wall in a submucosal position or that can lead to a stricture. Uh, avulsion, uh, and I think we're seeing fewer of these now. Uh, fortunately, uh, the most common setup here is uh, stone basketing stones in the proximal ureter, which is something really to avoid. Uh, getting a stone, a large stone caught in the ureter can lead to uh, avulsion which then would have to be repaired typically with uh, a major uh, open reconstruction. Uh, just to finish off here then, uh, uh, stone retropulsion, usually not a major factor. I must say I don't often use things like the stone cone and other uh, blocking type devices if the stone goes back up into the kidney, we would typically just chase it up there with the flexible ureteroscope. And I'll just highlight uh, kind of a final case here that uh, something that uh, was a, a bit of a shock to me, and I'm sure it'll be a shock to you when you see it, a case I had three to four years ago. 
was uh, obviously is a pelvic kidney and it was a stone in the ureter of the pelvic kidney. The patient actually had had a stent in for a week or two. We dealt with the stone and uh, in a routine way and the ureteroscope became uh, uh, stuck uh, inside of the uh, ureter and we couldn't get the uh, scope uh, uh, out of the ureter. And despite multiple efforts, uh, which eventually included cutting the scope off with a pair of bull cutters, this is what it looked like uh, afterwards, after the, the scope at the end of the case. But we actually had to open this patient to get that ureteroscope out. And it was a flaw in the instrument that led to it uh, snaring, if you like, inside the ureter and requiring open surgery to deal with the problem. Uh, I'll just finish off here, let's uh, flip through a couple of slides uh, in the sake of time. Uh, the most common thing we see, uh, I think, is uh, stent discomfort uh, afterwards. We all know this is very common. It's uh, most of the morbidity now with ureteroscopy is due to the stent that's left in, not to the actual procedure. So that's led to numerous trials, including this one by ourselves, a uh, randomized trial to see if we can get rid of stents. Uh, in certain cases, and I think it's become pretty well accepted now that uh, after ureteroscopy, uh, it is possible to uh, do the case and not routinely stent all patients. Uh, you know, if the stone is well broken up, the ureter uh, is intact uh, without perforation and so forth, that you can leave that patient uh, without a stent. In our practice, uh, that's only about perhaps 20 to 30 percent of the cases at the most, so we would still stent most patients, but it is possible to do a lot of patients uh, without a stent. And my final slide here, if you do leave in a stent, uh, one practically useful tip is to use alpha blockers. Uh, I think we do have a reasonable uh, number of trials now and series and so forth that show that uh, alpha blockers will help with stent pain. So that's a practical uh, suggestion for you as well. So I'll just finish off there uh, and thank you. And I hope we have some questions here uh, about this and the other talks. And in fact, why don't we uh, transition now? We've uh, had a few questions come in and I'll uh, seed these uh, amongst our audience here. Uh, or sorry, amongst our faculty and ask uh, a few questions and pose these uh, questions that have come in. Uh, so actually, I might take the first one myself. It's how long do you leave a stent in after your ureteroscopy and after you have a ureteral injury? So after a standard case, I would leave a stent for about a week. Uh, we uh, bring the patient back to the clinic. Uh, typically, a week later, remove the stent with a flexible cystoscope. Uh, if there is a ureteral injury, it depends on the degree of that in terms of how long to leave the stent in. If it's a very minor perforation, like from a guide wire, or perhaps from a laser, I would only leave the stent maybe another week, so leave it in for two weeks. If you have a major ureteral injury, you know, so a ureteral perforation where you're seeing fat and so forth, then I think I uh, would leave it in for four to six weeks. And I think the bulk of the literature and just practicalities of wound healing would suggest that a four to six week period of stenting is, uh, is likely uh, appropriate in a patient with a major injury. The next question, uh, and Tim, I might turn to you with this. Uh, so you're doing a case and you uh, put up a guide wire and you see purulent uh, material uh, coming out of the ureteral orifice. So uh, what would you do uh, in a case like that? Yeah, so that's a, a great question and I'm sure we've all seen it. Um, you know, if uh, the patient has been suspected of an infection has already been treated, um, I might think about it differently, but in general, if you do see purulent material come out, it's probably a good idea to um, stop the operation at that point, place a stent and, and return at a later time. It's probably a great degree of bacteria hanging out behind that stone. And the last thing you want to do is, is then do the case and potentially push that bacteria uh, back into the, into the patient's the lymphatic or blood system. So I would just put a stent in and, and call it a day and, and return after treating uh, with antibiotics. Do remember to get a new culture from that urine as well when you see that pus coming up. Okay, great uh, practical suggestions. Uh, Jorge, I might turn to you for this next question. 
Uh, what do you do when a urine culture is positive prior to ureteroscopy? Yeah, I treat this patient routinely with antibiotic, of course, uh, uh, based on the sensitivity study. And the question here is if we reculture the patient, we stop the antibiotic and reculture it, or we just stay on antibiotics till the day of the surgery. And I think the second option is what we do more frequently because many of these patients, when you stop antibiotic, they get infected again. So what I'll do is uh, uh, we review the last urine cultures and we decide what will be the best uh, antibiotic. We keep them on antibiotic until the day of the surgery. Okay, thank you. Uh, Prof. Sheng in uh, Guangzhou, I have a question posed to you. Uh, for the SMP operation that you described, is there a limit to the size of the stone that you would approach with the SMP? So is it two centimeters or three, or can you do any stone with the super mini approach? <clears throat> limited uh, less than uh, three centimeters, not for large uh, size stone, for uh, for more than five or Yes, unfortunately, you're cutting uh, in and out on us there with your answer, I think, with your internet connection. Sorry. Uh, let me move on. Uh, Kanji Wang, here's a question for you. Uh, what about pre-stenting before you read oroscopy? You know, I described it's not in our guidelines so that people should be pre-stented. But I think the practice in Asia is uh, a little bit different. So would you uh, pre-stent before you read oroscopy to make it an easier operation? What do you think? Thank you, uh, Professor Dester. Uh, at the beginning, we do the uh, practice of the uretoscope, flexible fr uretoscope. We always Pre-stent, and uh, after two or three years, when we master this scale, well, we figured out uh, not all uh, patients need a, a pre-stent. So now we just uh, pre-stent in the large stone, which we may use the large size of the uh, ureter sheets and uh, the high in infection chance patient will always present so we can uh, use a large size sheets to reduce the pressure within the kidney and uh, try to reduce the chance of infection and for just uh, some small stone and uh, normal chance of infection we did not present because they present uh, cause lots of trouble for patient. Uh, the same thing and the cost and uh, lots of sense. So that's that's what we do now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Professor Gao, uh, a question about these uh, cases that you showed us with a renal vein or a caval injury. You showed us that most of them can be managed conservatively, uh, surprisingly enough, with a big hole in the inferior vena cava or the renal vein. But the question is, there must be some indication here for open surgery, you know, at times to fix that problem. So have you seen cases that required open surgery? And when would you do open surgery to repair uh, such a case? Can you comment? Uh, uh, from the uh, literature, and uh, there is no uh, uh, open surgery to for these cases. And 
from our experience, uh, but only two cases, and uh, uh, have some limitations. So I think, uh, firstly, intravenous uh, misplacement of uh, ne nephrolistomy caster have a potential risk of infection, and uh, uh, venous uh, thrombosis, and uh, the risk of venous bleeding may be similar when the catheter in the renal vein or IVC. Uh, 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 for, for these pa uh, patients, and uh, we can use a balloon test to compress the damaged renal vein. And uh, some hematic, and if it doesn't work, uh, interventions therapy or open surgery can be considered. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Jorge, here's a, a question about re-sterilization of disposable single-use scopes. Questions coming from uh, South America, uh, <laughs> where there's economic challenge to reusable scopes. And the person is asking, what do you think about that re-sterilizing? And if you uh, support doing that, uh, how many cycles uh, could you use for a disposable scope to re-sterilize it? What are your thoughts? I, I know that in some places in South America and probably some other places in the world, they, they have what uh, they call a uh, semi-disposable use scope. So that means that they try to reuse the scope until they finish the four hour time life. So uh, should it be possible? I mean, I, I truly cannot answer what will be the option to re-sterilize this uh, scope and uh, you know the, the safety. And I cannot answer either if it can be just reused or, or it can be reused uh, if you put in a formal uh, sterilization process. I, I, I don't know about that, but I know that a lot of people in that part of the world, they are using the disposables and again they call this uh, partial reusable or partial disposable scopes okay thank you so we have time for one more question i think uh tim i'll direct this one to you uh, do you routinely do a renal ultrasound after every case of ureteroscopy do you think patients all need a renal ultrasound basically to rule out a ureteral stricture after a ureteroscopic procedure. What do you think? Yeah, so there's uh, you know, uh, some good literature that suggests that renal ultrasound screening on these patients uh, is for all patients. Um, what I find in my own practice, if I have somebody with a uh, embedded ureteral stone or significant hydronephrosis from a ureteral stone, or during the procedure, I notice that the stone is significantly embedded in the wall, a lot of edema as opposed to kind of a stone that's free floating and bouncing around those patients i do ultrasound routinely um, i'll also do some ultrasounding if i've dusted uh, a stone a larger stone and i want to make sure all the debris is passed um, so i'm kind of covering both problems with one image um, i think also it helps for the follow-up for patients because it engages them with their follow-up to have some process being done, such as the ultrasound. So I routinely use it for indicated patients. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think that pretty well uh, is our time. So I would like to thank everyone for joining us here today. Uh, I think the reports are we actually had several thousand people uh, joining us on the webinar today, which was uh, wonderful and certainly very gratifying. I also want to thank all of our faculty for your great uh, contributions, and particularly those uh, over in China. It's late in the evening there, and we appreciate you taking the time. I also want to thank our sponsor, uh, Poozen, uh, for supporting this educational activity. And uh, finally, if you could take a moment uh, and look to the bottom right of your screen, there's a course evaluation there. We'd greatly appreciate uh, 
all of your feedback uh, on this uh, for the future would be of great use for us. So uh, thanks everybody again for joining us here today. Please complete the evaluations and we appreciate your time and attention. Thank you.